You're listening to Thursday Night AMP on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. This is the Thursday Night Angry Marks.com Pro Wrestling and Mixed Martial Arts Podcast, also known as Thursday Night AMP, and we are just a few days away from the Royal Rumble, so we're bringing you a big spectacular show tonight with two guests. But first, let me introduce my co-host. My name is Stevie J, and my partner in crime is Jordan Garber, and he will introduce our special guest for Hour 1. Well, first off, how are you doing tonight, Stevie? I'm doing great because we've got a big show and we've got a Royal Rumble and Ring of Honor and so much to talk about with uh, two guests on top of that. So it's going to be a packed night. we got a big show tonight and uh, everyone listening, thank you again for listening and of course keeping up to date with the name Jordan Garber and of course AngryMarks.com. Tonight's first guest is no stranger to Winnipeg Wrestling, a personal friend of mine. His name is Mike Davidson. He is best known for formerly running WFX Wrestling. How are you doing today, Mike? I'm fantastic. I appreciate the two of you for letting me come on the show tonight. Our pleasure. So pretty much, like I said, you are no stranger to Winnipeg Wrestling, and obviously everyone uh, who is in the wrestling business has a story about how they got into it. How, is, uh, how did it go for you? How did you get involved in the wrestling business? Uh, believe it or not, I was a little younger than you are now. I was a uh, teenager in high school, and my cousin is Vance Nevada. And in 1993, Vance Nevada got involved in Winnipeg Wrestling with River City Wrestling run by Wayne Stanton. So I wanted in pretty bad. And by 1995, that summer off of high school, I convinced him to let me start training and to start setting up the ring and to start refereeing shows. And actually it was Vance and Robbie Royce that really sort of guided me and I started training in very late June of 1995, and by August 3rd, I debuted as a referee. And that's, that was how I got in. It was River City Wrestling. And it was, uh, it was a great, it was a great opportunity being 16, because Vance had enough influence that I didn't really get ribbed much, and like, everyone kind of gave me a shot, because I was a kid, and oftentimes kids don't get a lot of respect, and I was a little bit mouthy, so, uh, it's a good thing I had the, sort of the protection and the guidance from Royce in Nevada, definitely. And like I said, uh, you and me, we're no strangers to what happened in Winnipeg Wrestling and, and its history for sure, so it's really good that we both can relate to that in some way pretty much. So like you said, River City Wrestling back in the day too, there were some controversies about it. There were some good things about <laughs> it and there were some bad things about it. I, um, I, there's tons of stories that I've heard about personally about Wayne and uh, River City Wrestling as well as the fact, fact that you are also a cousin of Vance Nevada. Am I correct? Yeah, cousin. Um, it, giving credit where credit is due, from 1993 when they started until about ni- 1996, January 1996, River City Wrestling gave guys an opportunity to wrestle every two weeks, and and it was, a I think, a pretty legitimate operation, and it was an amazing place to break in. So, giving credit where credit is due, but at that time, River City Wrestling is respectable, definitely, definitely. All right, so pretty much, uh, I'll ask a few questions, uh, then uh, we will go to Stevie, as he will ask a few questions as well, and I'll go back and forth throughout the interview. Let me uh, kick it off, pretty much. Uh, you, WFX Wrestling, normally someone yep. starts a wrestling promotion, and it's just a small little wrestling promotion at first. But you, yeah. you went the extra mile, and you've had excellent production value with the product. It's continued to mm-hmm. grow, and you've grown big names. Pretty much, how did WFX come all uh, come about? Pretty much. Okay, so WFX. The thing is, it wasn't my necessarily just my vision. I got there. The owner was a guy by the name of Jeff Dick, and Jeff Dick hired me and said, "I want this to be a marketing arm for a company that I run. I want you to get wrestling fans." Involved or interested in my other company, so he hired me, paid me a salary, and I had a simple mandate: get on TV, and this has to have a big, a big time approach to it. So, as opposed to what independent wrestling might be in local, in, in most local places, we were told go big, go secure the best talent, make sure it's lit professionally, make sure the sound is amazing, and make it an experience. And uh, in 2007, right after the Chris Benoit uh, situation where the tragedy, uh, I was told, okay, this, this fall we're starting, and we had to think of a name, and we had to think of a concept. 
And I was worried that the industry was going to be so black eyed by what happened with Benoit and his, and his wife and his, his son that the people, especially parents, would turn off the product. So I decided that we would name it Wrestling Fan Experience. And it would be all about if you came to a show from the three hours that you invested and whatever you paid for a ticket, that we gave you something that WWE ne- didn't necessarily give you and that you couldn't get at a local independent show. So we went, we went with an approach that fans were going to see uh, different things and it was going to be more interactive and that there was going to be a lot more talent and they were going to have access to the talent. And that was the goal. And I think we did, I think we did pretty good with it. We had after parties. And then that was in 07. Then in 2010, the same Jeff Dick bought a, or, uh, secured access to a TV studio. And he said, okay, we're going to go even bigger. And so the goal was to produce a weekly television series. And we, we produced a, the first taping. And Chad Sokolovich out of Michigan sent the, the TV, the first couple of episodes to a couple of broadcasters in the U.S., America One being the biggest one. And they liked it. They ordered, they ordered weekly episodes. So we were in the position to have a carrier, uh, that had great penetration in the U.S. And that's how, that's how it came to be. And then you, uh, this started right to the whole, uh, um, concept of like, te- uh, television production and, uh, film production. Something that I used to have yeah. involvement in back in high school. And I have a feeling, I think you worked with my, um, vocational teacher who helped you with the uh, TV tapings. Just tell us pretty much how you got involved with TV tapings and how you got that started okay. and uh, how you did a good job at that. Okay. Uh, you're speaking of Ken Playtink, who was my roommate when I worked at a TV station in a small city in, in Canada, Brandon, Manitoba. And so I was a TV sports anchor, and Ken was too. So we became very good friends. In 2005, with a different company called AWE, we decided we were going to try to do uh, pay-per-view specials. So we, we, you know, got an amazing venue at the University of Manitoba called the Investors Group Athletic Center. And we went big. Uh, I think our first show had, uh, Billy Gunn and Rikishi and, uh, Jamie Noble. Uh, and, and Axel Duggan was on the first show and we produced two pay-per-view specials that actually broadcast in Canada on pay-per-view. And I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think we're probably the first group to produce our own show specifically for pay-per-view in Canada. And that probably, in a lot of ways, made us as big as, say, Scott Demore's Border City Wrestling. And probably Scott's company and our company were probably the two biggest since Stu Hart Stampede Wrestling. So that was quite a quite an accomplishment. And it, and a lot of that credit goes to the to the um, vision that Jeff Dick had because Jeff Dick said. You know, I'm going to get behind this and I'm going to invest money in this. You better go big and you better go big or you better go home. And in our case, we went big and then we went home. So that's how it went. And then you had VFX and it was a huge product. It was growing throughout the country. And then unfortunately it folded. But what I've seen lately is I've seen these um, AWE overloads, which you um been promoting a lot. And I've always yeah. heard this thing called bring it back, bring WFX back. <laughs> what is like the, all the work that has been given into get, to bring this product back? What is the likelihood of us seeing another WFX event? And that's a good question. Right, right now, what we're doing is we released all the episodes of WFX Overload onto uh, YouTube, and every week we put up a new one. Right now, we're on episode two, and then episode three will go up. And the YouTube channel is uh, WFX Overload. So if you go to YouTube and you search. WFX Overload, our channel will come up and we hope people will subscribe to it and they'll get an idea of what the quality was. And we had like, you talk about the first match in Overload history, it was Kushida versus Mentolo and we had uh, Eugene Dinsmore and we had Johnny Fairplay and we had Bushwhacker Luke and we had Billy Gunn and we had Michael Elgin before he had ever made it to Ring of Honor. Uh, we had Rick Victor before he made it to WWE. We had uh, Emma, who's Tennille Taylor, before she uh, made it to WWE. So we had all these people who we put together a team of people that either went back to WWE or in Jesse Goddard's case, went to TNA. We had him probably seven matches into his career. And and the episodic television, which was written originally by Liam Phillips and then I took over writing television, was, was put together very well 
Bob Hawley, Hardcore Hawley, uh, Hurricane Helm, basically the best of the best in the industry, Charlie Haas, were all brought in to be a part of this weekly TV show. And our goal, we knew we were never going to be WWE because that's nearly impossible, right? It's going to take a lot of magic for someone to ever get mentioned in the same breath as WWE. And for that matter, TNA, you know, we couldn't spend to their degree, but we wanted to be in that same conversation. Top five in North America was really our goal. And that's, and that's what people will see when they go to the WFX Overload, uh, YouTube channel. And they can follow us on Twitter at WFX Wrestling and they can follow, or they can go to our Facebook page, which is, uh, facebook.com slash WFX Wrestling and they can sort of see the pictures and everything. Now, you asked the question about the hashtag bring it back. And that's something, um, I have constant communication with people and it's, it's new people. It's not people who've been involved in the old product, but there are people who were involved in the old product who support this, who say, you know, what would it take to happen? And I'm very honest. I've put together a plan and I've, I've talked to, you know, some incredible people in the industry. And I, I had the benefit of working with Bushwhacker Luke in, in the last of WFX and his wisdom and all the territories he worked in for 30 years. And, and so what we've done is we've put together a plan. Now, Somebody said, I'll believe it when I see it. And you know what is amazing? I, I look at that and I, I see it as a challenge because believe it when you see it, if they knew half of what would go into something that is a vision this grand, they should have nothing but a lot of respect for it because it's ballsy, it's, it's gutsy, it's, it's brave. It's all those words that, that describe a true challenge. But let me tell you something. At this stage of my life, 35 years old, if I'm going to do something, I want it to be bigger and better than anything I've ever been a part of. And that means it's got to be better than it was in 2010. So for us to do that, you could see what went into to the product in 2010. That's the type of energy that's behind it right now. And and we've, we've secured a couple of sponsors, and we've got some communication going on with a broadcaster. And there's actually an agency involved that's willing to help us shop this this concept. But I believe, in all honesty, that if I was to put a percentage chance on it, I'd say 65, 70% chance the WFX will come back. The question is, everyone's going to say, oh, well, could Winnipeg handle this? And let's be very honest. The Canadian dollar is 80 cents right now, okay? This product can't look at Winnipeg and say, that's the be-all and end-all. So it's got to look at where it can create the infrastructure to do something like this and to grow from that infrastructure. And so it might not be in Winnipeg. It might be in an American city. I happen to be in a, in a position to get an American visa so that I can work on both sides of the border. And I know a few others can do that. Um, so I would bet it's quite likely going to be a North American product with a presence in Canada and a presence in the U.S. And I think it could happen. I think it's I think it's closer now than ever, personally. And uh, before I uh, bring it to Stevie to ask a few questions, that it's bringing WFX. It's good that you um, <clears throat> sorry about a cold, but bringing it back yep. to, like to, to a North American audience instead of a local standpoint will be better. Because if you just bring it back to Winnipeg, you know how much politics and crap you're going to deal with once that comes <laughs> up, right? To be honest, I'm not at all worried or alarmed by politics. Let me say this. It was named Wrestling Fan Experience because it was supposed to be a product that fans could get behind. So when I hear fans say, oh, seen it before, then they're done that. They don't realize what actually inspired them. It has nothing to do, a lot of people have the mistaken opinion, oh, Mike Davidson and his ego. And that's not true. You'll never see me put myself in a match, put myself over. You'll never see me in an angle, you know, basically jobbing out a guy in order for me as a booker to, to validate myself. This was strictly about, okay, we have an opportunity to put this together, let's do it. We wrote this because the fans will get behind it. We did more for undiscovered talent than probably any other company. I can name five guys that went from our product to WWE or TNA or Ring of Honor. I can name guys that were in WWE that got a second light based on what we did. So that had nothing to do with us. That had something to do, and you'll see it in the episodes, the way the fans responded to certain talent. Charlie Haas debuts in episode four, and you'll be amazed at the reaction Winnipeg gave him for his debut. Bob Hawley debuts, I believe, in 
episode seven or eight, and he gets an overwhelming response. Sabu was brought in, and he gets an incredible response. Gangrel and the Brotherhood, which was Kevin Thorne and Rick Victor, who has been known as APOC. We did, we never ever thought about ourselves. We put together a product that we believed fans would get behind. So I love it when a fan says, yeah, been there, done that, and then goes to local shows or, or so many independent shows, which are flawed by one thing, a guy that's going to put himself over ahead of what is, what the fans want. That happens too many times. It didn't happen with our product. So the challenge of, oh, I'll believe it when I see it or been there, done that, hey, keep saying it because I think it fuels the fire. And it, and it pushes the people that want to bring it back to push harder. And that's certainly what we're at. Uh, Stevie, back to you. Let me, uh, I'll let you ask a few questions uh, for Mike. All right, Mike. My first question is, earlier in the conversation, you said WFX went big and then it went home. So what I want to know yeah. and what I think our listeners want to know is, what caused it to go home? Is it the politics that Jordan keeps talking about? Was it money? Was it talent leaving to go to WWE, TNA, Ring of Honor, as you said? What caused it to go home? Uh, that's a great question. I'll be very honest with you. Uh, the person who was the financial benefactor of the company, uh, he got into a taxation issue with the Canadian Revenue Agency, and that froze a large portion of his assets. And the reality was, uh, I remember, I believe it was in August of 2010, he sat us down and said, you know, it's going to be a bumpy ride here, but I'm committed to keep it, keep trying. And he did keep trying and he did his best. But unfortunately, as a, as a single financial backer, TNA has been in that position five, ten times where they had to keep going back to the, to the Panda Energy and say, look, we have no more. We, we've missed payroll. We can't keep going. And luckily their financial benefactor, continue to put money in. In my situation, which I was hired by the financial benefactor, wasn't me selling him to keep going. Uh, he just, he was very straightforward and, and in fairness to that person, Jeff Dick, I think he's done more for Canadian wrestling, definitely for Winnipeg wrestling, than any other person. He's put more behind it. He's put all of us on a bigger stage than we've ever been. And for that, I shake his hand and, and have nothing but the kindest words for him. And if it hadn't been for him, there wouldn't have been a WFX. So that was really what it came down to was, you know, he ran into some problems with, with the tax man. And, and when they froze his assets, you know, albeit temporarily, it, it certainly hurt us. Now, was there money coming in from the America One deal as well, or was that a, a broadcast deal where it was just a handshake, like you provide the product and we'll air it? Uh, it was a combination of both, actually, because we had a, a m- multitude of different carriers. Uh, we were on something called At Sports TV. Uh, we were on America One. We were on uh, several different carriers. And in some cases, it was like a syndicated deal where they pay a right fee to, to run Nash or they pay a right fee to run uh, Judge Judy. We got a little bit of that. Uh, America One, I don't remember the specifics of that particular deal. I think that one was a handshake deal. So there was a little bit of revenue. But to be honest, I'll be very, very forthright. It was costing us about ten thousand dollars per episode, pretty close, maybe somewhere in there. I don't think we were generating ten thousand dollars in revenue. Now, that being said, in the current plan, when I talk to people about getting involved with this, and people talk to me about expanding on this, um, the reality is, I think any wrestling company has to have a five-year plan, and they're not going to be in the black in year one. I don't think Ring of Honor was in the black the first year Sinclair ran it. I know TNA hasn't been in the black. They maybe had one year out of 12 or 13 or 14 in the black. Uh, WWE is the only wrestling company in North America that operates in the black. So I think the key is right now is to create a product that in year one can really capture the imagination of wrestling fans and get wrestling fans really motivated, inspired, and, and dedicated to the product. And then from there, in year two, grow, grow your market share a little bit more. And then in year three, start to monetize what your investment has been. Guess what? In any business, when you're going big, your first year, you're going to have a lot of money you have to put out. And in year two, you're probably not going to hit that point where you're in the black. But if you believe in your product, and if the marketplace and your customers believe in your product and get behind it, and they know that what they're buying is actually 
getting you closer to the black and, and you're reinvesting in your product, I think the people will actually take a, a level of ownership and, and get motivated and get really dedicated behind you. And, and passionate fans at Winnipeg, we're lucky. We see it in three different platforms of pro sports. We have very dedicated, passionate fans. I think that, I think North American wrestling fans are the most, I, I think they're the most passionate and I think they're the most loyal fans of any sports genre because their business gets shit on all the time. They get laughed at for being a wrestling fan. They get dismissed because it's not a legitimate sport. It's not what critics will call real entertainment. So they're kind of, it's like bastard children. Nobody wants to really pat them on the back. But I believe that they will get behind something and they will put their heart and soul behind it. And I think that will have a very positive effect on the overall vision for any group that's going to make it in the wrestling. Well, now you mentioned the local sports in Winnipeg, and that's one of the things I was going to ask, actually, was if that had an effect on WFX and the houses they drew was having to compete with the local sports franchises. No, we were very fortunate. It was before the NHL came back. Uh, we were actually drawing pretty good, but to keep up with our with creating new episodes of TV, and we would only shoot from one studio, similar to what TNA was doing at the time. We had to run every third Friday. So the unfortunate part of that is fans can get burned out on the product because, oh, I can miss this one. I'll go to the next one, right? Especially Friday night when you start getting into the summer in Manitoba where you only get four months of really nice weather. Try to get them out on a Friday night when they can go to the cottage or they can go and do something outside, right? So that's a challenge for us. But I don't think that the local sports organizations really hurt us, actually. I think it, I think we were creating a mark, uh, a, a niche in the marketplace. Uh, and I think they were getting behind it. I think the problem was strictly that the financial resources weren't there when we needed them there. Cause our growth spurt was going to happen in fall and winter and in Manitoba where there's not much you can do outside. So you have to go indoors. Movie theaters do better in Manitoba in the fall, in the winter, in the spring than they do in the summer. And we were, we kind of peaked in August, unfortunately, because of the financial resources. The goal was always hit big in the third quarter and the fourth quarter of 2010 and then ride a wave that would have, ridden, that would have driven you into a huge expansion in the summer of 2011. It just didn't happen. I wish it did. And you know what? A lot of people point at me and say, well, Mike Davidson blew all the money. Believe me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in the position I've been in for the last 12 years working for somebody if I blew all his money carelessly and he was dissatisfied with the, pro- with the productivity. It's never been a case of, it's funny. I've, I've heard it before where, you know, people in the local business say, you know, if I had the opportunity, if I had the so-called mark money that Davidson had, Wow, would we be further? No, you wouldn't have, because you wouldn't have known who to push. You wouldn't have brought Michael Elgin in and pushed, pushed him as a top heel. You wouldn't have realized what you had, that you had the resources to go out and find an independent talent from a different territory, because the ego would have gotten in the way that you would have said, oh, well, you know, local guy, and I'm not going to paint a picture and say, well, this guy isn't as good, but they would have thought, oh, these Winnipeg wrestlers are just as good. And that's not how we recruited. We had Winnipeg wrestlers, but we knew we could recruit from anywhere in North America, and we certainly did. And and, and you'll see it in the product at WFX Overload. And that's not a slight on Winnipeg wrestlers, because I'll tell you this. Kenny Omega may not like me, but he is definitely the most talented guy that ever came out of Winnipeg. And I'll say that bar none. I'm glad I get to say it on the record. Kevin Chevy may not like me, but I pushed him to the moon, and he wa- he is a very very, very talented wrestler who probably doesn't get the respect he deserves. And 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 the list goes on and on and on that I'll say that about. You know, so so if there's anybody who says, oh, I'm being negative to Winnipeg wrestlers, I'm not. I'm saying that anybody that's ever said, oh, if I had da- the money Davidson had, I would have done so much more. The reality is I don't believe they would. And I'm not stopping them from going and finding the money and doing what I did or doing better. Go find it. And if you can't, eventually you got to shut up because you got to either you have to put up or shut up, right? I've been put in the position several times to put up. And I, and, and that's why I'm here talking tonight. I don't have to shut up. I can speak. My legacy will speak louder than my words will. 
Well, you've so, got an open mic here on Angry Marks Podcast Network, so you can definitely say anything I you shall, want. <laughs> you have to say the word angry mark right after I said that. I sound like an angry mark. Well, that's, now, the that's what I wanted to ask so. you, though, because uh, I, I got a look at Jordan's cheat sheet before the show tonight, and one of the questions on there was, do you have heat with Danny Dugan? And you already talked about people oh, not yeah. liking you, so I have to ask that one before I go back to Jordan. I appreciate that qu- I, I appreciate that question. I, I love Danny. Danny and I, we are a laugh a minute. I have, if, I don't know if he has heat with me. I don't think he does. We communicate regularly. I, I have a lot of respect. And you know what? CWE just had, I believe, their sixth anniversary show. Sell out with Scott Steiner. There's not much negative I'll say. Although people are going to say, oh, well, he talked about a, a booker pushing himself and they're going to point to Danny. That's not the case because Danny's talent speaks for itself. Um, I, I, I think the CWE vision and the WFX vision completely different. And, and part of what I want to see happen with WFX is it to exist and not be a Winnipeg wrestling company. And I don't think that CWE is a Winnipeg wrestling company, to be honest. I think it's a Manitoba wrestling company. And they even run into Saskatchewan. So I, I have no, no grief with him at all. I, I, I'm proud of him in a lot of ways. I, I've known him since, you know, he broke into the business, I think, at 14. Every year he's gotten better. And, and at his age now, I think he's knocking on 30. You know, I wonder when that's going to plateau because I think he's better today than he was five years ago. So, you know, I've got nothing but very kind things to say about that. Well, you, it's funny that you bring up CWE because one of CWE's main guys on the roster is one of your best friends in the wrestling business and outside of the wrestling business. A guy I'm quite familiar with, I'm a friend with outside of the wrestling business is Shane Madison. Tell us about your friendship yep. with Shane Madison. Shane Madison is single-handedly most responsible for every booking job I ever got. I have nothing but the kindest and, and most amazing things to say about Shane. Um, in 19, I met him in 1999. I was booking River City Wrestling, and he was brought in. That was my first booking job. And he was he came in. He showed up, and I looked at him, and he had gear, and he had he had physique and he had a tan and I was like wow this, this guy's a little bit different than everybody else and him and I worked the program because that's what the promoter wanted he wanted a heel booker to work Shane, Shane Madison uh, and then in I went on to be a TV broadcaster came back a year and a half later and uh, a, Bobby J's booker Vance Nevada was leaving and I believe something happened I wasn't too hands on I was actually going through depression and and I think it was Madison talked to Vance Nevada and said, look, you're going to be gone. Mike's the most creative guy still here. Why don't you, you know, transition the book to him somehow? Anyway, it might have been Bobby. Bobby J was the one who ultimately gave me the job and paid me to do it. And, you know, it, business, you know, Bobby recently in a podcast said that he wasn't as complimentary to business going up as I might be in my recollection. But you know what? Here's what I'll say about Shane Madison in that era. From 1999 to 2004, if Shane Madison was in a good booked program in the main event, houses were high. And I'm talking uh, him and I in, in 2002 in the fall did about 400 people at a weekly venue. Okay, now that's not easy to do, a lot easier in 2002. All due respect to anybody else who's running now who says 400 or whatever, right? He wrestled, he wrestled main events against Will Damon. He wrestled main events against TJ Bratt. He wrestled main events against Adam Knight. He wrestled main events against Chi Chi Cruz and Mike Davidson or Mike Myers. They all drew and drew substantially. So people, a lot of people don't like to give him credit because he maybe was involved politically. He helped me get me the booking job with TRCW, PCW. He introduced me to the money backer for that company. And he's the one who introduced me to Jeff Dick for WFX and AWE. So every booking job I ever got was thanks to, to Shane Madison. Now, I'll flip, I'll flip that equation and say all the hot main events that he drew in was booked by Mike Davidson. So together as a team, it's like a head coach and a starting quarterback. It works in a certain dynamic. You give a certain book or creative freedom, and you give a talent the right the right ingredients he's going to draw. And that's what happened from two thousand from nineteen ninety nine 
to 2004. There was not a bigger draw locally than, than Shane Madison. This is a guy who when we, who when we tried to put in the depression angle as a heel, turned into the hottest baby face in the company by accident. So I have, I have highest praise for Shane Madison. You bring up uh, Bobby J as well, as well as uh, Vance Nevada, who you talked about earlier. And uh, everyone yep. in Winter Big Wrestling, everyone knows who Bobby J is. The nicest guy you'll ever meet. He loves to party. He loves to go to the spike. Which is awesome. <laughs> I go to the spike all the time with Bobby J too. It's great. Um, yeah. But your experiences with Bobby J, tell us about that. I, I consider them all positive. Uh, one thing I'll say about this. It would be wrong for me to say anything negative to anybody who owned a company and gave me the ball and said, you're the man. Bobby is one of the guys that fired me in that position. And he felt he had to. And to be honest, in that landscape, he probably had. He, I understand it. You know, it was a pretty, business was good. But he, I, I understand, you know, recently he said, you know, that I, I like to pick on guys. And, hey, I believe there's people that shouldn't be in the business. And if you have to pick on them for them to get the point, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I am a, a huge proponent for a great rib when the, when the opportunity is there. And I don't care if that rib is heartbreaking to the person who gets it because that's real life people. People get, people get bad hands dealt to them all the time. I have no grief with Bobby for firing me at the time. It was quite different. I told him, you know, firing me is a big mistake. And I started PCW and there was a lot of piss and vinegar that was all about being better than Bobby J. He motivated me. He fueled me. It, but when he gave me the book, it was the best opportunity that I, that I got at the time. And you know what? He was, he worked his ass off to provide the guys with places to work. And, and, and he believed in everybody. Everybody got a shot, whether they were the most talented or the least talented. He just believed everyone was equal and he gave everybody a shot. And what you said, he's a, he's a great guy to have a drink with. And you know what? I think he's knocking on 50, but he, he still parties like he's 23 years old. Nothing negative at all to say about Bobby J. He said his ears would be burning, but I think he'll be surprised that I got no, no beef with him. The guy is totally like, he's lost all of his weight. There's, I don't know if anybody <laughs> who has something bad to That's say about That's the best Bobby thing J. you can say about him? No, he, the man's a, a complete class act. He's even let me stay over at his place a few times while we were partying the crash at. Like, the man is a complete class act, a terrific wrestler, and at the time when he ran uh, Top Row Championship Wrestling, he was an excellent promoter. Bobby J, to me, is one of my favorites in local wrestling as an interviewer and as a fan. He's a total, total complete class act. I have nothing bad to say about Bobby J. Now we switch gears and we talk about Lance. No, Nevada. no, no. I want to add one. Hold on one second. I want to add one more thing about Bobby. If it hadn't been for Bobby J coming through what he did and starting up TRCW, there, you would never hear the names today of, uh, Shane Madison. You might not hear the name Adam Knight. You definitely probably wouldn't hear Mike Davidson. So you, the reality is, um, I think him giving us that platform at that time is unbelievable. It, it had an unbelievable impact that I don't think people have ever really given it too much thought about. The option was Ernie Todd, and, and a lot of us just didn't want to go there, didn't want to be there. Bobby gave us the option, and and so, you know, I, I, I owe him a debt of gratitude. Now you can go on to Vance if you want. Well, pretty much, and I've had a kind of a follow-up with him before, and we talked it out, we discussed it, but I want to know your opinion on Vance Nevada, your own cousin in the wrestling business, and of course in real life. What are your thoughts on Vance Nevada? Do you want me to sugarcoat and say something nice, or do you want me to say something whatever you want? It's, that's what Angry Mark is for, so. <laughs> 1995, Vance Nevada got me into the wrestling business. 1995, 96, 97, Vance Nevada protected me. Vance Nevada was the most political guy in the wrestling business in Central Canada in those years, and probably right up until the 2000s. Vance Nevada will tell you he knows how to book. I'm here to tell you Vance Nevada couldn't book himself out of the paper bag. It's true. He did not know how to, he didn't know who to push. He didn't know how to push. He believes in a yay boo spot for the heel and the baby face in the second match. He, 
just based on the amount of influence he had, he was able to train a lot of guys. Metalone is a better wrestler now, not because Vance Nevada trained him, but because Van, because Mentalo set out after the past. He gave him, Vance gave him the bare necessities. And that happened with every other guy that Vance Nevada ever trained. The way I learned how to book was by watching what Vance Nevada would do and saying to Vance, I think you're wrong. And it was private conversation. We were very close friends at the time. Vance, you're pushing the wrong people. And he would say he thought he knew what he was doing. Vance Nevada wouldn't draw as a, as a wrestler in any degree. And he couldn't draw as a booker. Okay. And, and I'm going to sound ultra negative here, but it's true. And if he wants to, if he wants to step up and say, Oh, wait a minute. I drew, I drew, I drew. Let me tell you something. In 2002 with PCW, with Andrew Shellcross in his first month in the business, and John Newen giving us um, the money to bring in names. We drew 1,500 people in Winnipeg. Some will say 1,700. With Eddie Guerrero, Honky Tonk Man, and Brutus Beefcake. And then, in late 2005, we drew 1,000 again with the Steiner Brothers and Billy Gunn and Chuck and a whole bunch of people. And then, in 2008, 1,000 people again, WFX with Sonny and Eugene and Chris Masters. The common denominator is that all three of those shows that I just mentioned, I was the booker for, and a thousand people showed up. I don't think Vance Nevada has drawn 3,000 people in however many wrestling matches he claims to have had in 15 or 20 years of a career. He, he's a historian, and he claims to be a renowned author. But here's the reality. If you're writing about history, and all you're doing is saying, on April 17th, 1987, this happened. You're not creative. You're reporting the facts as they happen. The fact you're that right. you're the only guy who wants to be tedious enough to care about whether wrestler A and B wrestle to a no contest does not make you special. So I don't have a lot. I can say good things about him. He got me into the business, protected me. Certainly at that time. I was political enough, but too young to be able to, you know, take the heat that I might have caused. And he certainly helped deflect that heat. And he's a nice enough guy. I have nothing to say about him as a human being. But realistically, I don't, I don't think there's anything special about him, honestly. And, you know, he'll write a book and say, in, in his book, he says, AWE, only got on pay-per-view because of Steve Stryker, Darren Metzler. It's inaccurate. That's not how he got on pay-per-view. But he writes it like it's historical fact in, in an encyclopedia. And it's fucking horseshit. And maybe if he writes another book and puts in more stats of how many matches Mental Will won and lost, you know, we can, he can write the, he can write it accurately. If he calls me and says, how did AWE end up on pay-per-view in Canada? The actual guy that deserves the credit is a wrestler in Ontario, Chris Tidwell, who introduced me a year before for a different project to the people who made the programming decisions for pay-per-view. But he never asked me directly. He sent me an email and said, I'm writing this book, what do you have to say about AWE? And I just didn't respond, right? I didn't want to go on the record for his book. I'd go on the record for anybody else. I didn't want to do it for him. So he wrote inaccurately. And, you know, I think I think his book was kind of sh shitty, to be honest. So that's that's my opinion of that matter. Well, Jordan, so, if I can I'll jump in to... real quick, I, I just wanted to bring up one quote from the page for his book, which is called Wrestling in the Canadian <laughs> West. So everybody knows yeah. which book we're talking about. And this quote comes from the Honky Tonk Man, and he says that Vance Nevada is as significant as the Hearts or any of the top people of the business in Canada. So clearly, you disagree with the Honky Tonk Man's endorsement. The Honky Tonk Man is being far too kind to Vance Nevada. Because, okay, maybe if you say Ross Hart, Keith Hart, one of the hearts that really was obscure, maybe one of the daughters, Vance Nevada could be that significant. He's not as significant as Stu Hart. He's not as significant as Brett or Owen Hart. And I don't think he's in the same category as Bruce Hart. 
So I don't think Honky Tonk Man is being fair. I think he's saying, well, Badge Nevada is my friend, so I'm going to say something that's way too nice about him. That's my opinion of that. All right. I just had to get that in. Jordan, back to you. All right. I'll ask a few more questions, and then we will uh, wrap it up for this first half, and then we will talk about the Royal Rumble and Ring of Honor. But pretty much two more questions. Tell us about the heat you carry still to this day. Uh, what do you have to say about that? You mean the heat that others have with me? Yes, exactly. Oh, I I don't live or die on it. Some of it was caused because I believe in a great rib when I see it. And, and I get scapegoated on ribs I had nothing to do with. You know, and, you know, I, I think it's funny when somebody has, when a bad rib is pulled on somebody and they say, fuck, Davidson pulled this. I think that's great personally. If I didn't do it, I think it's even better that I didn't do it, but still got the credit for it. Um, and some of it has to do with, I, I don't claim to be easy to work with. And, and I, you know, if I didn't, if I thought someone was great, I, I treated them like I thought they were great. And if I thought someone maybe had too good of an opinion of themselves, then maybe I suffer from that. And that's maybe why they don't like me, but I didn't go out of my way to blow up their tires if I didn't think they deserved it. Um, and the one thing I will lean on is the talent that I pushed in 2010. They all did something in the business. So, you can say, oh, well, you shithead, you don't know everything about the, who's good or not. But Michael Elgin did way more in the business than, say, you know, local wrestler, insert name. I was going to insert the name. I'm not going to do it. So, you know, like, people have heat. I think it's great. Because I'll tell you this. I, I said this to somebody I really respect a couple of days ago. I said, if I ever end up in a world where 10 out of 10 people love me, I'm not going to like that world. And if I ever end up in a world where 10 out of 10 people hate, I'm not going to like that world either. I'm very happy with a 70-30 split. I prefer to be 70, 70 people like me and 30 people don't. But when it ends up 30 people like me and 70 people don't, I don't care because I have a very thick skin. I don't care what people say about me. I, I hope if you're going to say something bad about me, base it on truth and reality. If you do that, I have no issue with what you're saying. But if you base it on, well, you know, you were kind of like somebody said, oh, you're, you, Mike Davidson's really smug. Great. Mike Davidson's also a hardworking guy and very passionate. And when I ran WFX, I made sure I was the hardest working guy and I made sure that it didn't matter that Mike Davidson was there or not there so much as the talent were pushed first. The fans were the most important piece and that the product reflected that. And I think if everybody did that, if everybody thought, hey, how are we going to get 50 new people to like our product this show? How are we going to get the house up from dozens to hundreds, from hundreds to thousands? That's what you need to strive for. And and companies that are in business, in some cases, 10 years, five years, two years, you got to be trying to create new fans, create an experience, develop their passion, and create their loyalty. If you do that, I'm going to have nothing but respect for you. If you're a wrestler and you say you're this, you better be able to back it. And and the peers in the industry, other companies better be booking you because you're that fucking good. Don't sit there and say, I'm a big deal in Winnipeg, and Mike doesn't like you. What have you done elsewhere? Right? That's what, it ma- that's what matters. I don't mind that you have a healthy opinion of your own talent. Everybody needs to have that confidence and that swagger. Don't take it to heart when somebody says, well, I think you could be better. And that's that's what it amounts to. If that creates heat, shove the heat up your ass. I don't care if you got heat. You know, I have heat with certain people for certain reasons. Marty Gold has heat with me for good reason. I wrote a scathing blog about the poor guy. It was funny to me. Unfortunately to him, he took it to heart. Marty's the most entertaining guy I know, one of the smartest people I know, but he takes things to heart too much. Never forgave me. I don't mind that. You know, Andrew Shellcross for a very long time had heat with me, but he, him and I always had a level of respect for each other. Ernie Todd and I, I don't have any positive really to say about him. I didn't work for him since 1997. I have no ambition to ever work for him again. Any negative he has to say about me, he can take it with me. 
negative energy is the type of thing that put, that creates cancer. For sure. And uh, what is everyone listening? What do they need to know about Mike Davidson? I think that is the most broadest question you ever could have asked. <laughs> I was going to say, what, the, <laughs> what don't they know that they didn't just learn in the last 45 minutes? But meaning, okay, like, here's what, what, you, what should the fans know as one thing? Like pretty much about Mike Davidson, what do you want the fans to know most? From a wrestling fan's per, from a wrestling fan perspective, here's okay. what I want them to know: that if I put my name to a show, if I say I'm involved with this wrestling product, it is going to strive to be something better than I've done before. So if you've liked PCW, AWE, River City Wrestling, PRCW, or WFX. If I'm saying five years later, I'm going back in the business, and I wasn't out of the business because I didn't have opportunity or I didn't have ambition to be in the business. I just had it. I have a very good living. I make a very decent living outside that I, you know what, when you get into your thirties, if you're driven to do your hobby, the wrestling is the hobby to me because when I put myself in it, I don't go toes deep. I don't go ankle deep. I don't go knee deep. I go all the way in until I'm drowning. So imagine, what else can I do when I'm in there except devote my entire life to it? Danny Duggan devotes his entire life to wrestling. So he has to have a level of success to make a living because he's that deep in it. I'm just as deep, if not deeper, when I'm in there. So if I go out there and I'm doing it, they need to know. I take it seriously. I believe there's a certain potential that this could be. And I think the one thing, there's only one thing that makes me tick. Whether the fans hated me or loved me, whether the wrestlers loved me or hated me, whether you're a heel or a baby face in the business, you have to make people care. Sometimes it's negative energy and sometimes it's positive energy. Like if you, if you as a person can't create an emotion in the people, you're, you're screwed. You're in the wrong world. You can't get a girlfriend if she, you can't get her to create energy. You can't get a job if the guy hiring doesn't doesn't have an emotional attachment to you after the interview. Right? He can hate you, but he needs to believe you're going to be talented and be something that's going to add to his business. If you can't create that emotional interest, you're screwed in life. And one thing I can do, one thing I can say, I can always create emotion in the people I'm talking to. So that's what people need to know. Whether they understand me enough to like me, whether they think, oh, that guy is a fucking asshole who's full of himself. I don't care what they think, but they care enough to have an opinion. I appreciate that. All right. And uh, is there any plugs you would like to put out there, Mike? Uh, I would like people who care about checking out a good product, a good wrestling product, to check out the... WFX Overload YouTube channel. I would, if they want, they can follow us on Twitter at WFX Wrestling. I pick on the TNA executives on there. I got, I got banned by Vince Russo for saying I didn't think he was that creative. Poor guy couldn't take it. <laughs> Another guy who thinks I'm an asshole. And I would like, if they want, they can follow, like our Facebook page, WFX, uh, at www.facebook.com slash WFX Wrestling. And I'll tell you this. I believe Right now, the chances are better than ever that WFX will return to television with a product that will be brand new, and I believe it could happen in the fall of 2015. I know there are people that want it to happen. There are sponsors that want it to happen. I believe there's executives formerly in WWE that would like to get behind this product. I hope it happens. I will do anything I can to make it happen, and it's, you know, if it's meant to be, it's going to be, and I promise, this product is going to be something that people are going to look at and say, it's better than I thought it was. Just like if they look at the YouTube channel, they're going to leave with the opinion of, you know what? Whether they whether they liked Mike Davidson or they didn't, it's better than they thought it was going to be, or it's better than they wanted to say it was going to be. That's what I want. Thank you so much, Mike, for being on tonight. Jordan, thank you. All right, Mike. Steve, thank you very much. Mike, before you go, I got one more question for you if you got another minute. <laughs> I got as much time as you need. All right. Well, this is the last one, and then we'll let you go. But since you mentioned APOC, and we know him better as Victor of Connor and Victor in the Ascension, I wanted to know what you thought, having known him 
when he first got his start in the business of what they're doing with him right now on TV. Okay. I said this the night he debuted on Raw. I messed up because I did not know what we had with with Victor. And Eugene came up to me and he's like, you're looking around for a top guy. You don't need to look any further. And he pointed at, at, at APOC and he said, that's your guy right there. He's got talent. He's oozing talent. I didn't see it. I, I thought he was good and he had good size and I needed a heavyweight. He looked like a heel. And I, I really thought he was good in the role that he was put in, but I didn't see the potential. Um, he's doing what he's being told to do. And I think I love tag team wrestling. I love it. And, uh, the tag team, the Ascension tag team, they remind me more of Chronic than they do LOD or the other guys. Because of maybe the way they look, I don't know why, but that's what I see when I see them. Um, I think they're going to be stars, but I don't think, WWE doesn't push guys as tag teams for long. I think what will happen is that they'll eventually get repackaged and be split. I think he'll have a healthy, long career in WWE, and I think he deserves it. So, my opinion of what, he, what they're doing on TV, I think they're throwing something at the wall. People are talking about it, so it's not so bad. It's great that he's going to work with Billy Gunn, another WFX alumni. I think that the negative feedback, hey, it doesn't matter as long as you're creating an emotion. You know, Buff Bagwell made a career out of people not understanding him, and everybody had an opinion. It, it, you have to worry when nobody has an opinion. And, and I can give you examples of wrestlers where nobody gives a shit. I remember our creative guy, when he when he started with the WFX product and he said, and I don't want to say names because it, it would be offensive if I said, oh, he said this guy, this guy, this guy. But he said, take a look at this guy. What is a this guy? And insert name, Paul Evans, right? When you're in the independent wrestling and you're creating a gimmick, realize that the more character you have, the more that they can talk about after, the better off you'll be, Right? If you're just going to be a guy with a body in, in wrestling tights and your name's going to be Steve Evans or Daryl Bradley, you're screwed because they're not even going to remember your name and they're not going to remember anything about you, right? But if you're something significant like somebody who was convicted of a crime, you know, something to... You're, you're something that you played football or you were a boxer or you were, you know, a vampire, right? They can get behind it because they don't need to remember your name. They can say, oh, the firefighter. Yeah, he's pretty good. But if you just have a first name and a last name and you think because you're good looking or because you say, come on, everybody, that they're all going to get behind you and remember you, you're, you're done, done. What's a Vance, Nevada, right? I don't think people are going to work the next day after they went to a local show going, that guy, BC goodness, Vance, Nevada. They're not. He doesn't, he didn't give them enough to remember because there's not enough there. <laughs> That's my opinion. Well, I guess Rick Victor is giving people something to remember, but it's not necessarily complimentary, but you're right. He is creating memories right now. So maybe that's something of the Vince Russo philosophy you could actually agree with because Russo always said, as long as people are talking about you, you did something right. Yeah, well, you know what? People still talk about Outback Jack. <laughs> right? he, it didn't work. It didn't work. But if a local wrestling show said, in the main event, Outback Jack is going to wrestle local heel, people would be like, the same guy? And they're going to be curious enough to want to check it out. I would be, I'd be like, who in their right mind? I booked Virgil once, okay? So, <laughs> All right, well, that's sir. that. That's that's pretty much it. One thing I'll say for a wrestling fan right now, between Lucha Underground and New Japan, New Japan Pro Wrestling and Ring of Honor and TNA and WWE, there's so much wrestling on TV that you get to pick the show you like the most. It's like picking the sports team you want to win. So, it's the perfect time to be a wrestling fan. And to be honest, out of all those companies, the one that suffers the most in the current situation is TNA because everybody gets to compare to TNA. And if Lucha Underground is better than TNA, that's very bad for TNA. And if Ring of Honor is better than TNA, that's very bad for TNA because TNA has a bigger budget than all those companies. So they've got to accomplish more than every one of them. 
I can't agree. And that's more. all I've got to say, unless you have any more questions. No, that's it, Mike. I, I thank you for the time tonight. Thank you for getting in touch with Jordan and coming on our show. It's been a great interview, and we'd love to have you back again.